Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of January 7th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussions following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, our thoughts on the Alaska budget as the Alaska legislative session approaches. Second, HB 331, the oil tax credit bonding bill, survived its first court challenge. Why we nevertheless believe the upcoming Alaska legislature should kill it. And third, what's being lost in the rhetoric over the wall? The fiscal implications of the partial federal shutdown. And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. Oh, yeah. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets here on the program, uh, talk, talking about oil, gas, politics, and so much more. Uh, every week he comes in to hit us with his weekly top three, and uh, today is no different. So today it's all about budgets, bonding, and border walls, government shutdowns. <laughs> I mean, it's all kind of, it'll be, it'll be something. I was going to make it three Bs, but that didn't really make sense. Brad Keithley joins us. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Mike. We'll start off with number one here, which is this article from uh, Elmer Bren uh, Elwood Bremer over there at the Alaska Journal of Commerce talking about uh, Governor Walker's OMB director, Donna Arduin, which we've kind of uh, admired from afar here from the go, go, initial. Gov Governor Dunleavy. Governor Dunleavy. Did I say OMB Governor Walker? Director. My bad. Governor Dunleavy uh, as OMB director, uh, Donna Arduin. I'm sorry, I was looking at Governor Walker's name on the article when I said it. So, you know, I, I have, I'm old. What can I say? Uh, <laughs> so th this has got some encouraging words in it, uh, but suss out and read between the lines here on this. Tell me what you see in this interview uh, from Bremer uh, about the, you know, balancing this budget. Well, I think we're in for a very, very, very difficult uh, uh, 2019 uh, legislative session. Uh, Governor Dunleavy is calling uh, uh, calling the cards as he sees them. He, he's, he's calling a spade a spade here, which is uh, that we've got a $1.6 billion deficit. Um, and uh, the article says that we're going to balance the budget. $1.6 billion is a third of, of the budget that Governor Walker left behind. He left behind about a $4.8 billion spending budget. A, a $1.6 billion deficit is a full third of that of that 4.8, um, and that's a that's a huge 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 gap uh, to try to deal with. And if if Governor Dunleavy comes in with a budget, and he's got till February to do it, but if he comes in with a budget that tries to close all that, as the article suggests, by cuts, uh, we're going to have a big debate in this state finally uh, about what what state priorities are. We've been papering over that, uh, over that debate for the last seven years by using fiscal reserves. As you and I have talked on the show, we've used up about 18 to $20 billion of fiscal reserves that the state had built up over time um, uh, to, you know, sort of paper over the, this discussion. Uh, but now we've used all those fiscal reserves up. There's very little left. The SBR, the statutory budget reserves drained. There's less than $2 billion left in the constitutional budget reserve. Uh, they've sort of tapped all of the other cushions 
uh, uh, all the other couches, shaking out all the other cushions to get all the loose change out of those. And we're pretty much down to it. So th this article is, is setting up what I think is going to be a very difficult session to finally confront uh, the elephant in the room, which is we're not bringing in anywhere near enough revenue to finance the type of government that we've set up. And and the debate this session, I think, is going to be about what type of government do we really want and can we afford? And if we want more government than we can afford based upon the revenues that we have historically had, plus uh, Hammond 50-50, um, then how are we going to pay for it? How are we going to pay for right. extra extra government? Right. Well, and I think you're addressing uh, to the the interesting one of the interesting quotes out of this article for me was what you were just talking about the governor essentially or the govern the legislature uh, essentially kicking the can down the road year after year uh, and utilizing the savings um, to push things down the road and that that's the first quote from Arduino in this article where she says, I don't believe in budgeting towards hoping revenues go, go up. The budget should be steady and predictable, so we shouldn't budget hoping that we're going to get more revenues next year. And I just thought, like, wow, that's a unique perspective <laughs> based on, you know, past administrations and everything else. Everybody seems to be betting on the if come of what might happen next year instead of looking at what has actually come in and basing it off of kind of worst case scenario. Yeah, and we need to drain that sort of of oh, we can push it off to next year out of the system. Part of that part of that needs to be drained out uh, through you know looking at realistic oil price forecasts as opposed to oil price forecasts that that have significantly higher numbers in them. I mean the the oil prices are are back up to about fifty five dollars today. That's fifty five dollars. That's not eighty dollars. They're coming right. back up, but they're coming back up to that level. And frankly, part of it, Michael, is is facing up to the reality that even if we get increased production, that increased production is coming significantly from federal lands, and the state doesn't get a, as much revenue from federal lands as it's historically gotten from state lands. Um, and, in, and, and so that increased production is not bringing the increase in revenue uh, that I think some people anticipate. Tammy Wilson, who, I, who you and I both love, uh, Tammy did a, a, a piece, an a, a interview with the Fairbanks News Miner uh, last week or the week before, and each time the reporter brought up lower prices, Tammy was responding with, oh, no, but there's, you know, we're looking at increased revenue. Well, frankly, increased revenue doesn't have the same bang for the buck that it used to because it's coming from federal lands. And on federal lands, uh, the, the state gets some tax revenue, but this is new production, and under SB 21, there's going to be very little tax revenue in the early years from new production. We get no royalty. Uh, the state sort of uses a pass-through. There is some royalty, some revenue royalty sharing from the federal government to the state, but under federal law, that's obligated to go back essentially to the North Slope Borough um, and be used for local projects as opposed to as opposed to statewide projects. So. This is, we need to bleed out the expectation that increased production uh, is is going to produce additional revenue, and we and this needs to be the session uh, that we get real about all this. Right. And and one of one of the good things about about the the conversation that that Elwood had with with the OMB director is it looks like we're going to have a real conversation this session. Right. Well, and that's something I said yesterday and you and I have talked about in the past that, you know, I, I know we've said in the past, I know I've said in the past, we've got to get serious this year about spending, but we always had that buffer. We always had some money in the SBR. We always had some money in the CBR. We always had, there was always some pocket change somewhere around where they could kind of kick the can down the road. But this is it? This is the last draw available from the CBR. You draw that. You draw this deficit. You are out of money. There is no other choice but to either tap hard into the earnings reserve, which affects the return on investment for the PFD uh, for the uh, for the permanent fund, or you have to institute taxes. And they've been kicking the can down the road, and they have reached the end of the road. This is the year to get it done. Well, and we need to realize that taking additional money out of the earnings reserve is in fact a tax on future generations. If Absolutely. you pull, pull money 
uh, above the long run uh, a real rate of return if you pull additional money out of the earnings reserve to use as a fiscal reserve to supplement, you know, to, to sort of use it as a savings to supplement, what you're doing is re is reducing the the investment base over in the earnings over in the permanent fund, right? And you're reducing permanent future earnings and and future PFDs by doing that. In essence, you're taxing future Alaskans. So we are down to this. We are down to either we're going to cut spending or we're going to have taxes. And the taxes, you know, some people will say, well, we'll use the earnings reserve. Well, that's a that's a PFD tax on future Alaskans, or or the, the Alaska Senate. Uh, their old standby is go to cut the current PFD. Well, that's right. a tax right. on current Alaskans. So we're down to, we are down to uh, either cut spending or we're going to have taxes. Yep, that's pretty much it. And uh, it's got to happen. Now, uh, as you said, the tone of this article to me is very, very hopeful and positive. I came away reading this article thinking, wow, this lady is a gal who's really made her name, made her bones at being in and just, you know, going just going in and being a hatchet lady. And I mean that not in the negative sense, but going in and just finding the stuff and cutting it out, brunting, you know, weathering the storm of criticism that comes from various organizations associated with government, and generally speaking, leaving governments better off than they were when she got there. Yeah, she uh, she she may be the right person for this situation because you know, she's got another home to go to at the end of the day. Uh, her, right. her, her, her reputation is she comes into states, does does an analysis, makes the proposals, lives through the first session of them, uh, and then moves on to the next job. And and you know sometimes I've I've been through a lot of corporate um, uh, reorganizations, corporate takeovers, um, uh, where they've needed to bring in a a a, a, a re envisioning uh, CEO uh, that can make those cuts and then moves on to the next company. That's that's sort of what we've got here. Right. But it's it's it's, it's it, so I mean we can visualize what's going to happen, right? She comes out and she says a third of the budget needs to go away, a third of spending needs to go away. That's how we're going to balance this 4.8 billion dollar uh, budget down to a 3.2 billion dollar. Uh, revenue base. A third of the budget needs to go away. That means big cuts in the university, some cuts in K through 12, and you go on down the list. Now you've got the legislature. Uh, this has gone to the that will go to the legislature, and the legislature starts starts dealing with that. The legislature has done everything they possibly can in the last seven years to avoid confronting those issues. Now they're going to have to confront them, and now we're going to find out who we've really got in the legislature, who we've really put there. Uh, to deal with this situation and whether they're going to be up to the task of approving those cuts, making those cuts, uh, or they're going to be looking for uh, back doors, uh, uh, even more back doors through the earnings reserve or through or through other things. It's, it's just going to be a tough session yeah. uh, all the way through. Yep. And you and I have been saying that for a while. Final thoughts. Is that kind of the final thought on number one of your top three then? Well, uh, the final thought is uh, it is it. it we need to be prepared to have this discussion, and frankly, we need to be prepared not only to have the discussion about cuts, but frankly, we need to be talking about, to some degree, or at least thinking about, uh, if they don't make those cuts, what we're going to do on the revenue side. Because if they don't make those cuts, and if they start talking about the earnings reserve, which is the, the one remaining, quote, fiscal reserve piggy bank uh, left out there, then all then what we're talking about, as I just said, what we're talking about is just a tax cut on future Alaskans. And the question is going to be, is that if we're going to go to taxes, if that's where we're headed, is that the right tax approach? So we we, we don't I don't want to advance that discussion and presume that we're going to that we're not going to make those cuts and have to have the discussion. But people need to have in their minds um, what kind of revenue discussion they're ready to have if the legislature isn't going to make those cuts. I'll be honest with you, Brad. I was just, I'm back in this article by uh, Elmer Brem, uh, Elwood Bremer on this. And uh, I, this I found to be the most hysterical paragraph in the entire piece. Legislators have found spending cuts of that size, the 28% you mentioned, uh, cuts of that size unworkable in recent years, following several years of cuts totaling more than $3 billion, as state budgets have stabilized roughly at the current level over the past three fiscal years. 
There's only one reason why they've stabilized. And they really haven't stabilized. They've been increasing. So, I mean, I don't know if you could say stabilized, but I, I just love the verbiage in there. They found them to be unworkable. No, you have been unwilling to do what has been necessary to balance those budgets. Uh, but we'll just say it's unworkable. Yeah, well, the Senate. The Senate would tell you it's unworkable. You know, they've delved into it and and uh, and they've looked at, you know, stared these cuts in the face and and they just can't, you know, muster the political will to make those cuts. Here's here. Here's the thing, Michael, that, that is going to be a little tricky as we go through this session. And and I'm sure you and I are going to cross a few times as, as we talk about it. The reason I say that we need to be ready to talk about revenue issues is is we're going to go my, my fear is we're going to go through this session the administration is going to propose cuts uh the legislature is going to you know monkey around with those cuts and, and at the end as elwood says they're going to find them unworkable um and then we're going to get right to the end of the session and and everybody's going to say well we're not going to be able to make the cuts what are we going to do for revenue oh the pfd uh let's just cut the pfd or let's just take it out of the earnings reserve account um, and and paper over it again. Say it's all good, and we'll and and we'll really make those cuts next year. We'll look hard at making those cuts next year. And that sort of that sort of knee jerk of moving it to the end of the set, moving the revenue question to the end of the session, and then and then saying, well, we really got no op options other than to use the PFD or the earnings reserve to 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 fill that revenue gap. To me. I'm going to keep talking about revenue as 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 an issue through the session, not because I don't believe in the cuts. I want the cuts to be I want the cuts to occur, but because I don't have faith they're going to make the cuts. And I don't want to get down to the last 10 seconds of the session and everybody say, well, we've got no choice at this point but to have PFD cuts or we've got we've got no choice at this point but to pull out of the ERA. We, we, we need to be we need to be having that discussion. There are better options. Flat tax, as we've talked about on this program before, is right. a better option. We need to be talking about those options along the way so that we don't get down to that last 10 seconds and get cornered into another set of PFD cuts or, or an ER, ERA draw, which is just a, a different way of doing uh, future PFD cuts. Right. Well, and I don't think you and I are going to get sideways on that because you and I have discussed it that you're right. I agree with you. A flat tax is, of all the revenue options that have been presented, it is the most equitable um, and, and literally the most sustainable. Uh, and you and I have both also suggested, you know, to the horror of some of the listeners, that that's where the conversation's going, regardless of how much we continue to cry to the moon that there are no, there's no need for taxes, that it's a spending problem, not a revenue problem. Uh, the legislature has continually, over the last 25 years, framed it as a revenue problem. And because they refuse to address the, the you know, this, this fiction that they've created, we are probably going to be faced with it. I'm in agreement with that. And if, and if that is the argument that's going to come, uh, what is our new revenue source? I would much rather it be a flat tax than, um, you know, a 2% uh, flat tax rather than some kind of amorphous hidden tax in the form of the PFD or the taking of parts of the earnings reserve or whatever. I'd much rather have it be out in the open because, it, again, you've pointed out many times why it is inequitable to tax in any other way. It affects usually those making the top 5 to 15 20% rather than the rest of us. Yeah, so it's I I think that's just an important conversation to continue to have, and I and I and I and I, and, and I guess you're going to need to help me reinforce along the way, and I'll help you reinforce along the way. It's not we're not talking about that because we don't believe in the in the cuts in the spending cuts. We're talking about that because this last seven years has demonstrated to us that they're not going to make those cuts. When you get down to the end of the when you get down to the end of the session, they're just not going to do it. Right and. And we need to have we need to have had the discussion about what we do in that situation uh, in advance, so they don't corner us uh, into these PFD cuts or into ERA draws that that are 
just effectively future PFD cuts. Absolutely. No, and, and I think maybe, you know, again, we haven't talked about the taxing issue in a while. Maybe we need to revisit it because uh, I, I don't think we've had a conversation about the flat tax and why we've discussed it, um, you know, and taken a lot of heat for it. So maybe that's something we should discuss as well. Brad Keithley uh, is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, let's tease for a moment here number two on your weekly top three, which is the HB 331 lawsuit. Give me the 90-second synopsis here. So the 90-second synopsis is HB 331. Uh, it proposes to issue a bunch of bonds uh, to borrow money to then pay off producers, uh, the producers holding the oil and gas credits uh, in advance of when they otherwise would get paid, uh, kicking the cost of that program down to the, down the road to future Alaskans increasing the cost of the program uh, to future Alaskans, all so that we can pay off producers ahead of what the statutory obligation was. It was a, it's a bad statute. Um, uh, there's constitutional issues with it. The constitutional issues went to the court. Uh, the court has essentially said, we, don't, we understand the arguments, but, but we think it's constitutional. It'll go to the Supreme Court. The question is now, what should the legislature, the administration, Uh, and the Supreme Court do uh, with this issue when it comes before them. All right, and we will take that up on the other side. Returning with Brad Keithley. Uh, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're working on his weekly top three. We just got the teaser uh, at the end of the last segment. Uh, HB 331 uh, was put forward, a scheme to basically borrow money to pay off early debts that were already being paid off at the statutory rate. Uh, and in doing so, incur a significant amount of money uh, as far as uh, transactional costs and, and uh, borrowing costs and just down-the-road costs on this kind of stuff. Uh, Brad Keithley continues now with us on this number two of the three. Uh, Brad, um, this case, I'm assuming, is going to be appealed to the Supreme Court from reading between the lines on this. But I just want to remind people how damaging HB 331, if executed, could be to the state of Alaska and how ridiculous some of the arguments are that the administration, previous administration, has made. And I guess now this administration is making in support of it. HB 331 is, is to me, is just, is just bad legislation across the board. I mean, the argument is we need, we need to, to borrow the state, the state needs to borrow money in order to pay off certain producers in advance of of the timing that were otherwise the states otherwise obligated to make these payments we need to give them a chunk of money early in order to encourage a bunch of of exploration and production activity up on the north slope well let's think about it for a moment we've we've been reading in the anchorage daily news and in the alaska journal of commerce all about this new activity we have going on uh, uh, up on the slope, the expansion into NPRA, Conoco's uh, 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 exploration activities, uh, oil searches exploration activities um, uh, in on state lands, all sorts of activity going on uh, up there. And we haven't issued these bonds, and we haven't given them a chunk of money. Um, it's it's been that activity's been encouraged by. Uh, Oil prices has been encouraged by new discoveries, has been encouraged by new uh, technology, has been encouraged by uh, uh, a variety of things that have gone on on the slope, none of which relates to injecting this billion dollars of additional money early um, uh, into the oil patch. So the argument that we need this money to be injected to encourage this activity, I think, has been proven wrong by the headlines we've seen just in the last uh, six months out of the North Slope. On the down, on on the other side of that, what we're doing is we're borrowing a bunch of money, shoving the payment obligation out of this generation that that you know passed the statute and said we would make payments in this certain manner, shoving that shoving the obligation to make the payments through through this bonding through issuing debt down into future generations, and we've already moved a bunch of obligations to the to future generations. PERS and TERS ramps up over the next ten years. Uh, substantially increasing cost to future generations. We've now drained the CBR of roughly $12 billion and and used roughly $20 billion in fiscal reserves so that this generation could get through the uh, 
uh, through the, the oil price drop, through the revenue drop without either having to significantly cut state services or, or pay for it themselves through taxes. We've just drained the fiscal reserves and the obligation to refill those fiscal reserves are now being shoved to, to future generations uh, to put themselves back in the same position that we found ourselves in to have that money there when they hit a when they hit a rough patch. Um, so we, we're shoving a bunch of obligations already to the next generation. We shouldn't be shoving an extra billion dollars of obligations to the next generation on top of that. This right. generation, this generation needs to pay at least for something. Right. Um, and paying off those paying off the oil credits we've, we've committed to is one thing we could do to make sure at least we're paying part of our fair share of what the costs are. Right. And again, for clarity, for the listeners, for those who hadn't followed the HB 331 discussion, we were already paying back the oil tax credits at the statutory amount, the amount that is written into law that the producers agreed to when they signed up for the program. It was smaller than they had been paid in previous years because they'd paid beyond the statutory minimum, but they were paying it off and it would have been paid off by 2026, I think was the number. Uh, ever, all the tax credits would have been paid off as per the law, as written. Uh, but instead, they wanted to borrow this money, $880 million, and then stretch out the payments to 2030, uh, right about the time that the PERS and TERS obligation came due. Uh, and Brad and I estimated that with all the money that they would have saved, as far as quote-unquote saved, meaning the difference between what the statutory minimum was and what their payback to the bonds would have been, if they had spent that excess money, it would end up costing us an additional $950 million plus uh, right. coming up. I mean, it's it's huge. This is a huge mistake. It's b borrowing more debt to pay off current debt and and saying that you'll be it'll be better down the road because you borrowed the money to pay off money you already borrowed, so to speak. Uh, it's, yeah. it's it's insane. It, it, it is insane. I mean, we we have a so think about this for a second. We have a legislature that the last three years, first year was the governor's veto, but the legislature didn't override the veto. The last two years, the legislature just did it uh, did it themselves. The last three years have said. We know we have this statutory obligation to Alaska citizens. We know there's a PFD obligation out there, but we're just not going to live up to it. Right. So we're going to we're going to cut the amount we're paying Alaska citizens. At the same time as the legislature is doing that, last year the legislature says we know there's a statutory <laughs> we know there's a statutory obligation to these producers. We know we know what it is. We know we can we can pay it off. This generation can pay it off. But guess what? We're going to pay them more. We're going to go out and borrow money so we can pay these producers more uh, than we're statutorily obligated to do at the same time that we're paying Alaska citizens less than we're statutorily obligated to pay them. It was it's just a just an absurd uh, 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 perversion of the priorities that the, that the legislature should have. And, and I guess my point that I was trying to make at the beginning uh, and that I feel strongly about is the justification for this is we need to inject this money, uh, it, give this money, put this extra money into producers' hands or into these companies' hands so they will engage in oil and gas activity that will produce more oil and gas for us. Well, read the headlines out there. Read the headlines about what Conoco is doing. Read the headlines about what Oil Search is doing. Read the headlines about the oil and gas activity, uh, the renaissance, as some people put it, that we have on the North Slope. They're doing that without the – Without the uh, the the additional money being injected injected in it right. uh, through HB three three thirty one, so even the justification for doing this for doing HB three thirty one in the first place isn't proving isn't proving to be correct. We're getting the renaissance, we're getting the activity, we're getting the 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 additional jobs uh, without having to inject this additional billion dollars, uh, this additional advance payment uh, into the hands uh, into the hands of the oil and gas company. So it's it's just. H HB 331 was bad legislation when it was introduced. It was bad legislation when it passed the legislature. It was bad legislation when it's signed by the governor. And frankly, regardless of what the courts do with it, I think this legislature needs to reverse it and go back to the statutory scheme that we had before, the statutory scheme that the producers signed up for at the time they entered into these oil and gas credits in the first place. Absolutely. I mean, they did this eyes wide open, regardless of how they played it later on, all wide eyed and innocent like we had no idea. They got plenty of ideas. So, But they also know how to manipulate legislators. 
Uh, let's move on to item number three since we're down to the last three and a half minutes here. Item number three is the uh, uh, is the effect of the government shutdown on Alaska, and you're saying that it's deeper than we think. Well, it is, and it's not just on Alaska. So. <laughs> The, it, I don't want to get into the debate about the wall. There are people who believe strongly in the wall, people that, that, that believe strongly against the wall. Here's my point. We're spending, this proposal is to spend $5 billion above what Congress has already appropriated. We're going to spend an additional $5 billion. That's, that's at a time when we have record debt levels um, uh, the way it is, we have we're establishing record deficit levels in terms of the length of time we're we're about to go into in terms of trillion dollar plus debts. We're going to spend more money. This is this is to appropriate more money on top of what's already been appropriated uh, in order to uh, in order to do this wall. There's no offsets. Nobody's talking about a pay for in terms of reducing spending someplace else in order to spend this five billion dollars. It's going to be more than five billion dollars. And now. As a way of resolving it, they're talking about spending even more on top of that. So that's uh, give, giving the Democrats some money in order to entice them to vote for the five billion dollars that that the Republicans want, and that's uh, and, and so we're adding even more to the debt. And on top of that, shutdowns cost government money; they cost the economy money, um, and they they cost people uh, uh, dislocation and jobs. I mean, there's there's been articles about. Uh, about not being able to complete government contracts, about uh, uh, people being laid off, and they're going to have to be rehired. Um, talk about the time value of money of people going out and borrowing to be able to tie themselves. Companies tied themselves over uh, as the governor, as the government uh, withholds payment. These things, these shutdowns, cost money. So the 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 point that that's important to me through this process is not so much the wall. It's that once again. We're just ignoring the federal fiscal reality uh, that we're in, and we're doing things, we're taking steps, both sides of government are doing things and taking steps that are just increasing the fiscal ir irresponsibility uh, uh, that we're living through, increasing the deficit, the size of the deficit, uh, increasing the national debt, uh, and, and increasing dislocations on on the overall economy as a result of pulling government or, or, or having a stoppage in government uh, that's necessary to, uh, to, 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 to do some things in business. It's, it's a costly process and people just don't seem to be focused on the cost of it. Uh, they just seem to be focused on the politics of it. That's how we've gotten into this debt and how we've gotten into this deficit situation in the first place. To me, it's time that we face up to our national debt situation, it's time we face up to our deficit situation. If we want an additional $5 billion spent on the wall, fine, but we got to pay for it. And how are we going to pay for it? We need to have reductions uh, someplace else, or we need to have taxes in order to pay for the increased spending. Um, we need we need to think in those terms as we go through these situations. Yep, absolutely. Brad Keithley's been our guest. Brad, one of the things I think they forget about it is it's not just government employees who are going to get back wages. It's subcontractors and contractors and everything else, and a lot of those people don't get back pay. So there's a, there's a lot of details in here that people need to look at, and I, I agree with you. Too much politics, not enough fiscal facts involved here. And that's what really kills me, Brad. I was reading an article yesterday about this. And, and I agree with you. I mean, I would like to see a border wall, personally. I think that that would be a good start into securing our borders. Uh, I'm not a fan of the deficit spending. Uh, and I think what has happened is we have completely lost sight. I mean, this, this abuse of the continuing resolution has just given Congress free reign to do just basically whatever the hell they want, politicize the whole process. Uh, and there are real people being affected. Now, setting aside the federal employees who are furloughed but will then get – they're essentially on a paid vacation. They'll get – they'll come back. They'll get the full paid all the time that they were off. They'll be paid for and everything else. There are a ton of people out there that will not be paid back for all of those issues, and that uh, – and I, I think that's a, I think that's a, that's a big problem uh, that uh, uh, that we we just can't keep revisiting over and over and over again. It is, Michael. It it is a big problem. And yes, federal the federal employees. I know some people look at that as a paid vacation, but it's not really paid at the time. So people, 
you know, people live paycheck to paycheck. A lot of people live paycheck to paycheck. You got rent due. You got mortgage payments due. You got credit card payments due. You you want to go you want to go get groceries. You want to you know pay off pay off your bills as they're coming due. If you don't have cash flow from a job, which is what's happening to the federal employees, um, yeah, they get time off, but they're not having the cash flow to pay to keep current on their bills. So there's going to be a cost to them. Uh, uh, even if they ultimately do get those paychecks later, there's going to be a cost to them currently uh, from not getting the money. But the thing that really, the thing that really irritates me, and I've seen this starting to show up um, in some of the comments about how we're going to work our way out of this, is, well, okay, so the way we're going to resolve this is we're going to agree to give the Democrats some money for their priorities as long as the Democrats agree to $5 billion for the Republican priorities. And that's the way we got into, that's the way we've gotten into this deficit and this debt situation in the first place. If you're going to get some, I'm going to get some, we're going to spend more and we're just going to, you know, we're just going to borrow more uh, on the open market to, to finance and increase the national debt that's going to be passed on uh, to our kids. Th that paradigm has got us into this situation. Continuation of that paradigm will just continue to deepen, uh, deepen the hole we're in. We've got to start... We need to start thinking about, hey, you want five more billion dollars for something? Hmm. We need to cut spending someplace else uh, to create that five billion dollars. We just can't tack it on as a as a tax that ultimately will be paid for by our kids and grandkids. Well, and that has become the norm. I mean, that has become the norm. Just use the the fictional credit card that the United States has and just spend whatever you want, and somebody will figure out how to pay for it down the road. And that is what has led us to being $22 trillion in debt and having that debt jump up substantially in just the last 50 years. Uh, yep. I mean, that's all that it has done. Um, uh, what, Paul says something which I, I got to be honest with you. I, I know it's kind of a bleak thing to look at, but I kind of agree with. He says the deficit will not be fixed until the economy finally collapses and they're forced to cut everything. It'll be another depression type event to fix the deficit. And I, I, I can't say that he's wrong because there appears to be absolutely no political will to even look at the facts of the matter. <laughs> well, yeah, and it's not only. I mean, I, they're. There is some credibility to that argument, and in fact, that argument applies to Alaska as well. We'll not fix our deficit situation until there's absolutely no uh, uh, piggy banks left to break open. I, you know, my concern is they're going to break open the ERA. That's why I want to have this. I want to have an ongoing discussion about how do we finance this. If they don't make the cuts, how are we going to finance it? I, I'm, I'm concerned that we're going to break open the ERA, and then it really won't stop until we get. Once we get into that. It really won't stop until we get down to the permanent fund corpus that says by constitution we can't spend. And heck, they may try and find ways to, to do even that. So, yeah, there's an argument for that. But I, that's, that's absolutely the most irresponsible way to handle it, to just keep going until you have absolute failure and everything breaks apart. So it's incumbent on, on – I feel incumbent on me. It, we talked about it on this program. There are better ways to handle this. Uh, yes, not everybody gets, you know, exactly everything they want. They don't get, you know, this plus this plus this. Uh, somebody has to agree to, to cut back on spending. Uh, but we just we need to talk about about those and we need to become responsible. We've been responsible in this country before. In the 1990s, we actually had budget surpluses that we were paying down uh, the national debt. We've been fiscally responsible in Alaska during Governor Hammond's uh, era. We did things like create the permanent fund. Right. We've had we've had a track record of being responsible. We need to get. <coughs> excuse me. We need to get back to it. Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't agree more. Ron says I wouldn't disagree with a two percent flat income tax. After all the cuts that could be made were finally made, uh, I absolutely do not want government taking from me to giving it f to, say, for, exist uh, for instance, to UAA. Make the cuts, take the lumps, then impose a tax if needed. Uh, the problem is I think that they're not going to allow us to have that argument. But I think that's maybe something we should discuss again here in the near future, Brad. Yep, absolutely. Okay. okay. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. You can find him online. Links are at the top of the Facebook page here. You can see him right at the top of the video. Uh, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Subscribe to that. You'll see Brad's uh, uh, postings and all the things that he talks about in this regard. Brad, thanks so much for coming on board today. 
Michael, as always, thanks for having me, and I look forward to continuing the discussion. You bet. Thanks so much. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.